Hi, I'm Krista Clapp. I'm leading the Climate Finance Group at Cicero and also the Clean Invest Project, which aims to provide tailored climate risk information for financial decision makers. We bring together climate scientists and investors to improve our understanding of how to protect the value of investor portfolios against physical climate risk, to understand which physical climate risks require immediate attention, and to understand better which information and data investors can use. The International Research Consortium behind Clean Invest includes Cicero in Norway, Varnigan Environmental Research and Climate Adaptation Services in the Netherlands, I4CE Meteo France, and Carbon4 in France. Clean Invest is a JPI project funded through the European Research Area for Climate Services. As part of our work to provide guidance to investors, we've put together this series of investors, uh, sorry, a series of webinars to dive into different climate hazards and explore different case studies. Today's webinar focuses on the hazard of heat stress and is presented by Clemens Schwingshackel from Cicero. Thank you, Krista. I'm a senior researcher at Cicero and I'm working on heat stress. And in my presentation today, I would like to give you some information about the financial risks associated to heat stress. And I would like to start with the question, why do we care about heat stress at all? Now heat stress can have um, various impacts on diverse fields. And one of the most important one is the impact on health. What you can see here on the right graph is how the mortality increased dramatically about, um, after a very strong heat wave in 2003 in Europe. And that shows very nicely how there is an increased risk of mortality due to heat stress, but there is also an increased risk of cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. And both these um, um, effects, they can, for example, put um, a high pressure on the healthcare system and um, lead to uh, increased costs for um, the healthcare system. Another important point is that heat stress can um, impact the working productivity of workers um, because they have, they, if heat is high or temperatures are high, then they are generally less able to work. So um, it takes more time or they can just be like physically, they are in, in um, worse positions to, to work. But there, there is also this decreased ability to concentrate or an increased risk of injuries. And all of this can lead to um, staff shortages um, or to yeah, um, things being delayed and, um, and thus cause increased costs um, for investors. And the other part is also that it's not on, heat stress cannot only affect humans, but also infrastructure. And there can be physical damages, for example, by deformation of construction components um, or by increased risk of wildfires. And if that happens, then you might need to invest in better um, components that are better able to resist heat, or also to um, think about when you build new houses or buildings that you uh, avoid um, regions that are prone to wildfires. Now in this presentation, I will mostly focus on the human dimension of heat stress. And this is uh, mostly um, affected by four different factors. Um, the first and probably the most important one um, is high temperatures, because if temperatures are very high, then the human body needs to act to maintain um, its um, own temperature and to man maintain it constant. And that, of course, um, requires um, work or um, yeah, um, energy from the body. Second one is direct solar radiation, because if you're in the sunshine, then the human body absorbs this radiation and heats up additionally. And this happens, of course, mostly outdoors, and it can be avoided by just either going inside or by searching um, spaces in the shade. Then ele ele elevated humidity is also an important factor because that increase, uh, decreases the effectiveness of body cooling so that the body tries, usually tries um, by sweating to reduce its temperature, but the higher the air temperature is or the air humidity is, um, the less um, well this um, cooling works. Behind, um, behind heat exchange, but for working productivity, there are other heat stress indicators used or also for heat warnings. And all in all, there are more than 100 indicators that are available and that makes things a bit complex. And I would just like to give you a short um, um, list of heat stress indicators that are often used. I will not go through them. Um, some are used for health effects, others for heat warnings. And the one that um, I will focus on now more, mostly is um, um, for economic impacts. And this is wet bulb globe temperature. And this indicator is often used um, for assessing the effect that heat stress has on working productivity in different studies. And that's why I will um, yeah, show you now a map um, of the sweat bulb globe temperature and um, for Europe. 
So what you can see on the left side um, is um, like the values for, um, for this indicator in the year 2020. And on the right side, you see the projected changes in the future. And what you can see on the left side is that values are especially high in the southern parts of Europe. That's also something we would expect because we know there it's, uh, it's warmer. And the regions that are most affected are especially um, um, Portugal, Spain, southern France, Italy, the Balkan um, countries, but also southeastern Europe and Turkey. But you can also see that heat stress is even more, is, is even higher um, in northern African countries. On the right side, you can see the projected changes. And you can see that um, it again fits mostly to the regions or the changes are high in the regions where we have already today high heat stress. So mostly in Southern Europe, it's um, shown by the yellow or orange colors. But you can also see that there is a substantial increase in, the nor in Northern Scandinavia. Now this might need to lead to, to some effects because people in these regions might be less adapted to heat, but overall, the um, values or the, or the, the levels of um, heat stress are relatively low in Scandinavia today. So probably the most, or it's, it's, it's more likely that we reach some critical physiological thresholds in Southern Europe rather than in Scandinavia first. Well, um, now I, would, I talked a lot about like the climate part um, of heat stress, and now I would like to give you two examples or um, what are the risks associated um, to heat stress. And I would like to do that um, by using the IPCC um, framework that defines risks as a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. And the first example, uh, it's about outdoor work. And of course, I mean, the climate hazard, as I have talked about, um, in this case is heat stress, and this can be measured by the different indicators I just showed you. And for outdoor work, the exposure would, for example, be people that work outdoors. It could be, for example, be construction workers or farmers, and they might be exposed to high levels of heat and solar radiation. Then vulner vulnerability um, can be subdivided in two different parts. The one is the sector sensitivity, and the second is the adaptive capacity. And sector sensitivity in this case would be, for example, the age of the workers, and if there are any pre-existing conditions, that make, that make them more, more vulnerable to heat stress. But also the age of the ins infrastructure and the vehicles could be important if they're, for example, not well isolated or if there is no air conditioning in vehicles. And then for farming, um, also the crop varieties. If they are sensitive to high temperatures, then um, this is also, uh, they are also sensitive to, to heat stress. But there are, of course, also um, measures you could take to, to adapt um, to heat stress. And one um, example would, could, for example, be to shift working hours so that people do not need to work outdoors um, at noon, where it's usually hottest, but rather shift it to the early morning or to the late um, afternoon or evening. Then you could install air conditioning in vehicles um, to at least cool um, um, yeah, the inside of these of this vehicles. Increased mechanization could be a tool because then you could have more machines doing the work and less um, people because people are more prone to heat stress. And for farmers, you could also use alternative crops that are um, more resistant to high heat stress. The second example um, focuses on the health impacts. And here, the climate hazard stays the same. It's again um, heat stress. But exposure in this case is people who live in regions that are exposed to high heat stress. And this is particularly true for cities, because generally, cities are uh, a couple of degrees warmer in summer than the surrounding areas due to the urban heat island effect. The sensitivity in this case, for example, could be housing quality. So if you have um, houses with poor insulation, um, then the city structure is an important factor and the building density. So if you have uh, like a lot of buildings and a lot of concrete, um, then you are very sensitive to high, um, to high heat stress. But also the color um, of the buildings or of the concrete or the, uh, the roads, if they are dark, then they absorb more heat. Green spaces play an important role because um, First, they provide shade, but also the transpiration by vegetation usually um, decreases uh, temperatures. Then again, the age of the population or pre-existing conditions um, play an important role, and also the state of the healthcare system and the question whether it is able um, to, um, to, to like, um, deal with the high load of patients that might come um, during a heat wave. 
And the adaptive capacity factors in this case could be the installing of cooling systems, such as air conditioning insides, or also improved um, housing insulation, or for outsides to in, uh, install sprinklers so that people can cool themselves with cool water or have more parks or green spaces in general. Then an early warning system can also help to um, prevent um, the adverse effects of um, heat stress and also the improved healthcare system so that it is able to manage high loads and during heat waves. Now this now focused mostly on the risks and in the next slide I would also talk about what are now like the effective um, financial impacts um, of heat stress for these two, um, for these two examples. Now for outdoor work, um, the, the physical impact could, for example, be that you have um, yield losses or delayed termination of construction works because you have decreased worker productivities or staff shortage because of injuries. And this would um, increase the operation costs and of course also um, lead to loss of revenue. And for farming, you could also have reduced crop productivity that gives you less yield and also loss of revenue. For the health impacts, um, the increased risk of uh, cardiovascular and respiratory diseases um, could lead to an increased cost for the healthcare system. So for example, if you invest in healthcare system, you should consider that it might um, become more expensive because of these factors. And yeah, the same if the healthcare system is overloaded, then uh, the same, you need additional investments to be able to, um, yeah, to, to handle this load during heat waves. So to conclude, conclude this um, presentation, um, we saw that heat stress is a severe threat for um, various fields, especially for health, for worker productivity and infrastructure. And with climate change, we expect that heat stress um, is increasing in the future. And the identification of exposure and sensitivity to heat stress, that is a key factor to assess the associated financial risks and to avoid financial losses and different adaptation mechanisms are required to act against the adverse impacts of heat stress. Thank you.